Well, welcome to our class on Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, the outline for this class is being taken from the Gospel Advocate Foundations Adult Bubble Bible Study Series, and this is the topic for summer quarter 2024. Uh, this is now week two, and the plan was, I'm recording this before June 2nd, but the plan is uh, for Daniel Falkenheim to have recorded and live streamed the first class for this quarter, uh, which is entitled Return to Jerusalem. And so if you're looking for the first class, I encourage you to go to the live section of our YouTube channel, and that's where you'll find that first lesson. And like I said, hopefully everything went according to plan. And so I want to thank Daniel uh, for in advance. But by the time you're hearing this, after the fact, I want to thank him for teaching that first class that looked at, as you can see, Ezra 1, verses 1 through 8, and then chapter 2, 64 to 70. And Daniel always does an amazing job, and I will uh, maybe make some comments on his class after I hear it and mention that in the next recording. But today, we are looking at Ezra 3, verses 1 to 13. That is the entire chapter of Ezra 3. And the title here is Restoration. And so what we're going to see this week in this lesson, we're going to see the importance of worship in verses 1 through 3, and then the reestablishment of the feasts in verses 4 through 7, and then the temple in verses 8 through 13. The people, as they came back from captivity, wanted to restore the things that were important to God for his people. And these are three of the very important things, and we see all three of these in the book of Esther. I mean, Ezra. Sorry about that. And for the introduction, I want us to look at a passage in Philippians that encourages us to keep moving forward, to keep striving to do the things that are appropriate in God's eyes. And so we will be looking at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 21. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul points out that we have work to do all the time and he's going to press on. He's going to keep moving to make his Christian life the very best that it can be. He's going to keep pushing forward and pressing on to be as faithful as he can possibly be. And that's what we see in Ezra. That's what we see in the people. They wanted to get their worship back the way it should be. They wanted to get back to God's ordained feasts. They wanted to get back to the temple. And so they were pressing on as Christians, we press on as well. And notice the reason. Jesus has taken us in. He has made us his own. He possesses us. He owns us. He sacrificed himself on our behalf. And so because of what he has done and the way he has taken us in, we want to press on and do his will. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul gets even more specific about the pressing on, and it's toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's very, it, it's very uh, spiritually minded. It's very heavenward looking at the very least. But notice what part of this is forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Sometimes I think we get bogged down in the past. And do we learn from the past? And do we remember things from the past? Of course we do. But I think for Paul, he might be specifically thinking about when he was persecuting Christians. He just needs, he just needed to let go of that really rough past um, where he was in conflict with God and with Christ and just, and just move forward. But I think that's true for anything in life. I think it's true in our relationships. You know, we're, we're told 
in 1 Corinthians 13 not to keep record of wrongs. We're not to keep a log book about what people do against us. That, that's a relationship killer. You know, if my wife and I did that to each other, it would just be terrible. We don't want to keep the person that did the, the, the bad thing doesn't want to keep remembering it. And it's not healthy for the person that was sinned against or the one who felt offended or whatever. It's just not a good way to live. Our culture's moving toward living that way like all the time. And that is not a healthy thing. No one is ever happy in those situations. He continues, he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if any, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Stay consistent. And of course, for us, we have the the completed word of God. We've got the Old and New Testaments. We've got all this information that the people in Philippi would not have had. Of course, they would have this letter. Maybe they had a gospel. You know, we don't know exactly what they had as far as uh, the written word, but we are so blessed. And so for us to hold true to what we have attained might even be an easier task, at least as far as having the information. Of course, what it requires is a change of heart. Continuing through this look at Philippians 3, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. So follow good examples, and then he points out some bad ones. Verse 18, for many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And I'll say real quick before continuing, the people in Ezra and Nehemiah's time faced these enemies as well. There were people who did not want that temple rebuilt. There were people who did not want that wall rebuilt. The people were fighting to get it done. They had to press on. They had to stay strong. But notice these enemies of the cross of Christ, verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. When the mind is set on the world's goods, including indulgence of the belly, including food and other things that just give us pleasure, we glory in shame. It's not a way to be. If we end up that way, our end is destruction. Paul points out in contrast to that, and in Colossians 3, he says we set our minds on him things above, not earthly things. And so that makes verses 20 and 21 true for us in Christ. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So as we press on, as we forget the things behind and press on toward the things that lie ahead, as we move forward in our faith and our spirituality, as we move toward heaven and even set our minds on heavenly things, realizing our citizenship's in heaven and Jesus will come back again, we look to that next life. We move forward with confidence. We believe in a savior who is alive and who is going to come home to come going to come here to get us and take us home. All right, so let's look at our text in Ezra. The first thing we see is the idea of worship. Ezra 3 verses 1 through 3. When the seventh month came and the children of Israel were in the towns, the people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Josadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. 
So they get back to the prescribed worship that Moses had given them. They set the altar in its place, probably the place where it needed to be, right there on, on the temple grounds where they were going to rebuild this temple. It was important that they got the worship going. God wants us to give him honor and glory and praise. Does God need these animals? Does God need our money when we contribute on the first day of the week? No, need would not be the right word. But does he know that it's best for us to worship him? Absolutely, yes, he knows that. Sometimes we forget, but he knows what is best for his creation, for his people. So they gathered as one to Jerusalem in the seventh month. And it's interesting. We'll look at when Solomon um, assembled the men of Israel uh, when he was building the temple. And it is the seventh month, hence that the highlight there. And we'll also look at a little bit of what David did in preparation uh, concerning worship and the altar in just a moment. So they followed what God wanted. And notice it took some people. It took some people to take leadership. Um, uh, Jeshua, the son of Josedek, Zerubbabel. Um, these, these people were the leaders. They got things going. And these priests offered burnt offerings. They offered the worship to the Lord morning and evening, day and night. So let's look back at 1 Kings 8. One and two, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Athenim, which is the seventh month. So that could be part of the reason that in the book of Ezra, we read them doing this in the seventh month. And at the very least, it's a very great parallel. That may have just been the time that it was able to happen, but I imagine that that was on purpose. And then let's go back in time a little bit more and look at 2 Samuel 24, verses 17 to 25. David had sinned in taking a census, putting a focus on the physical and, of course, him, himself. And an angel was punishing uh, the people of Israel. So David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Arana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming toward him, and Arana went out and paid homage to the king, with his face to the ground. And Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. There, then Arana said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aranah gives to the king. And Aranah said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. What an amazing statement from Aranah. The willingness to give and give and give. And then he blesses David. May the Lord your God accept you. He even prays. For the king. Absolutely incredible. But the king said to Arana, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God 
that cost me nothing. Ooh, what an amazing statement that is for us. When we worship, we need to be giving. It should take something out of us. We are to die to ourselves daily. We are to take up our crosses. We are to put ourselves aside on behalf of the Lord. There is a cost to being a Christian. The main cost was the cost Jesus paid, the price Jesus paid on the cross. But we also are called to sacrifice. We are also called to worship and give. Very, very important. David did not want to do this with something he had not, that it wasn't, where it was not a sacrifice for him. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. Really awesome. David was a man after God's heart. He was a man that when one time he had to be confronted by Nathan, this time he just he just says to the angel, look, this is my fault. I have sinned. David was willing to confess that he was not perfect. He was willing to confess that he sinned before the Lord. And more than once, this seems to absolutely be his nature a humble man. And we get a great taste of that through all the Psalms. All right, let's move on. Continue in Ezra. Ezra chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. So they have reestablished, they have restored the sacrifices, the worship to the Lord. Now they are going to restore the feasts. Particularly, first, the Feast of Booths. And they kept the Feast of Booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the rule, as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, the offerings at the new moon and at all the appointed feasts of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink, and oil to the Sidonians and the Tereans to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus sent the people back to build this temple, and he said he would finance it, and he did. Absolutely incredible. It didn't keep the people from also donating and sacrificing to make this happen. And of course, they did as well. Now, one of the points the booklet makes, and I think this is important, um, they were able to do the sacrificings. They were able to sacrifices. They were able to worship God, even though the temple hadn't been rebuilt. And this is important for us to remember. Yes, God wanted the temple rebuilt, and it was going to be rebuilt, but the worship was important, even if everything wasn't quite in place yet. And they worshiped according to the law. They worshiped appropriately on the altar and with all the feasts, all the different things that they did. And this reminds us of something Jeremiah said when he is ridiculing the people of his day. So Jeremiah 7, verses 1 through 11 the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I'll let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words. And of course, Jeremiah is standing right there at the temple. He's at the gate of the Lord's house. He's right there in the gates of the temple. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Now, why were these deceptive words? Because God's people had put their trust in the fact that the temple was standing there instead of in the one 
for whom the temple was built, the Lord. They were trusting in the physical. They were trusting in the outward. They were not trusting in the Lord. And so they need to amend their ways and their deeds and not trust in these deceptive words. They were feeling that just because the temple was there, they were, they were not able to be harmed. That these prophecies that Jeremiah was laying out, that they would be taken away into captivity, were not true. Jeremiah continues, For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the sojourner, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own harm, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. The temple, the sacrifices, the worship, the feasts, it's all meaningless if the people's hearts are not in the right place. If they are not putting their faith in the Lord, all these acts are empty. And the same is true for us today. You'll recall what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 13. If someone does amazing miracles, if someone prays with great faith, if someone even gives him or herself to die, if there's not love, it's meaningless. The motives and the heart matter to God. The outward things need to be done correctly, and he cares about them, but they are meaningless without the right heart. All right. So finally, the temple. They've made progress in getting materials. And now, Ezra 3, starting in 8. Now, in the second year, after their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, made a beginning, together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and the Levites and all who had come to Jerusalem from the captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together supervised the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Hinnadad and the Levites, their sons and brothers. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. This was also proclaimed in Jeremiah. Let's look at Jeremiah 33, 10 and 11. This was prophesied. Thus says the Lord, in this place of which you say, it is a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again... Here's the prophecy. There shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. 
Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. Things will be restored. Things will get back to normal. Jeremiah prophesied it here, and we read it happening in Ezra chapter 3, verse 11. Absolutely incredible. Continuing in that verse, And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. So some were a little bit emotional because they had seen the former house of the Lord. And this one, probably not as grand as what Solomon built. In fact, we know that Solomon built and had one of the most prosperous situations probably in the history of the world and all nations, but definitely there in Israel. And so there was joy because of the building of the rebuilding of the temple and a little bit of sadness for those who could remember the glory of Solomon's temple. All right, so let's look at our applications for this lesson. Application number one, the effort of the Jews to construct the altar and worship God despite the threat they face from their enemies, is noteworthy. Fear, if left unchecked, can stand in the way of action. It takes courage to overcome fear. Christians must serve God no matter what the consequences. We will do this only if we are motivated by genuine love. So let's look at that first John passage. Verses 17 to 19 are the ones referenced. We'll start a little earlier than that and go a little bit past that. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And so in the booklet, the point of this application is that fear cannot stop us from worshiping, cannot stop us from doing the things that are appropriate. And here in John, 1 John, the Apostle John writes, there's no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear. So this love is vitally important. And if we love God, we'll face whatever opposition we need to, to do what he wants us to do. And then the last two verses of this section in 1 John, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, Whoever loves God must also love his brother. All right, application number two. The determination of the Jews to worship God in the manner prescribed by the law of Moses is commendable. Rather than devising their own plan for worship, the Jews sought to do as it is written. Although we live under a different law today, we should be just as interested in worshiping God in his prescribed manner. 
John 4, 24. We'll look at that in a moment. We do not have the right to change what God has authorized. I view worship kind of like a gift. If I know what the recipient wants, why would I ever get anything different? God has told us what he wants in worship. Why would we try to give him different things? We should always provide the gift he wants. If my wife likes to go to comedies, when we go to see movies, which she does, um, neither one of us like horror movies, but let's just pretend for her birthday I take her to a horror movie. Well, that would be ridiculous. Why would I do that? Knowing what she desires. Well, the same is true with God. Why would we mess with him when we know what he desires, when he has told us what he would like for us to do when we worship him? Our worship is a gift to him. It's audience of one. We will get messed up if we think the worship is for us. There are benefits for us. There are ways in which we are blessed when we worship and come together. And God recognizes that. And those things are laid out for us in Scripture. But the purpose is to give to God, to sacrifice to Him. That has to remain number one. So the John 4, 24 passage that's referenced here is the interaction between Jesus and the woman of Samaria at the well. So let's look at verses 19 to 26 of that passage. The woman said to him, the him there is Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. One of the first confessions uh, that Jesus makes concerning his identity. And for just in case um, there's someone who will watch this video at some point that does not know, Messiah is the Hebrew word for the anointed one. Christ is the Greek word. And so John, the woman is not saying he was called Christ, probably. That's probably John clarifying for his readers. But the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. Messiah and Christ mean the same thing, one in Hebrew, one in Greek. Um, and so that's that's the relationship of those words. Um, it does refer to the anointed one, and very specifically, of course, in the Old Testament, when you read about the Messiah, it's about Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ who is to come. Um, and of course, in this moment, the Messiah is right there talking with this woman. Um, and then as we look back, we're looking at the Christ who did come, the Messiah, the anointed one who has already done his amazing work on the cross on our behalf and has ascended into heaven. All right. So application number three, the emotions expressed by the people at the laying of the foundation of the temple indicate their genuine interest in what took place. If we are sincere in our efforts to please God, certain events will similarly stir our emotions. We may not be moved to shout or weep, but hopefully we will be moved to obey and serve. And just a little bit in contrast to what is said here, I think we are way less emotional than God would want us to be. We can't base our faith in emotion. I think we all kind of recognize that. We need to base it in truth. But I think... Our culture does not celebrate the way God would want us to celebrate. I don't even think we grieve the way God would want us to grieve. I think to be more open and physical and emotional in our celebrations and our grieving would help people's mental health 
in our culture. I think it's one of the reasons people struggle with this. We do not express ourselves well in our culture. In other places around the world, they do. They have certain times of grieving, and that's what they do. They set it aside, and this is the time for mourning. It may be a week, it may be two weeks, whatever it can be, but we don't do that. We kind of just let things linger and hang and go on and on and on forever. Now, that's probably not the healthiest thing. We probably are in a uh, situation culturally that probably hurts us mentally. All right, so let's move on to the discussion questions. There are actually six for this lesson. I encourage you to pause the video and think about these things one by one. If you're watching this video with someone else, of course, feel free to pause the video and actually have a discussion as you move through these six items. All right, number one, what role did unity play in the events of Ezra 3? Why does a congregation need to be united in its efforts? Number two, why must Christians seek to conquer fear? What steps can be taken to overcome fear? Number three, why do you think the Jews constructed the altar before laying the foundation for the temple? What can we learn from this? And number four, what role does money play in the events of Ezra 3? Number five, what do you think caused the emotional outbursts of those who wept when the foundation of the temple was laid? I, I gave you my opinion on that. Um, it could be that the people were just so overcome with emotion that the temple was going to be back. Number six, what can we learn from the way the Jews viewed Scripture? All right, those are great things to think about and discuss. Our next lesson will be from Ezra 4, verses 1 to 24. The title is Opposition. May the Lord bless us and keep us as we study his great word.